Mission Sunday. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to go through every mission that we support or do all of that stuff, but our message this morning is a, a mission-themed message, and in our uh, afterwards, there's a couple ways that we can respond to that service. There's a couple ways that as a church, we try and make a difference both in Grunthal as well as in our province as well, and finally in our world. And so there's going to be a couple things in the announcements later on. Uh, also, if there's time, if your pastor isn't too long-winded today, uh, I will also try and give a bit more of a report about what happened when I was on my trip with a short video. But before we do any of that, we've also been blessed. It all happened just Nicely the way we're following along in Scripture. Uh, it happened to be that we were talking about missions this Sunday. And my great friend Jeanette, you can come up. Jeanette Stone from, from Mozambique, well from Alberta, but from Mozambique now, uh, is coming to do a short report or a long report, it's up to her, on some of the work that God is doing with Sam Ministries in Mozambique. So I'm going to make sure the mic's on for you. There you go. Take it away. Good morning. It's wonderful to actually be in Grenthal, Manitoba for the first time ever. <laughs> I've heard a lot about you. Um, I've had the amazing privilege of working together with Rick and Heather and Sam Ministries until they decided to desert me <laughs> in July of last year. Um, but it's good to be here. And I'm the Child Sponsorship Coordinator with the Mission. And so this morning, I want to introduce you to just a little, another little part of Sam Ministries that maybe you aren't familiar with. So we're going to start with a short video, and then I'll just say a few more words after that. So if we can roll the video. My name is Jose Roger Vikiseni, and I am 20 years old. I was living with my mother and father, and I could see that they were very poor. As a result, they could not pay for me to go to school, so I started going to school when I was eight years old here at the mission. Initially, they, um, this, the students are registered in our Bush, Bush school, um, which we have primary or like preschool all the way up to grade five. They receive a meal every day there at the school. They receive um, health care at the clinic that's right there. And then after that, they have to leave the community to go on for grade six and seven right now. Um, then after grade seven, they move to another community that is even farther away. When they hit grade 10, um, there's a potential for them to then go to vocational training. Um, or continue on with grades 11 and 12 at that same school. When I completed my grade 10, I wrote an entry exam at Joaquim Mara School. And with God's help, I qualified for the school. So now I'm studying at Joaquim Mara, and I'm doing accounting. For someone to know that they can achieve something, uh, having a role model, I mean, uh, Christ is God's role model to us, uh, but, but we need uh, flesh and blood role models as well in our lives. And when we have those, it gives us a chance to achieve what we would probably never achieve otherwise. And José Roger is one of the perfect examples of that. He saw guys like João who had a chance for a university education because of sponsorship. And now he is mentoring uh, between uh, 20 and 30 kids on a weekend and uh, helping them to fully realize their potential. And I think that's stimulated him. God's used that in his life to, to help him to see what's possible. When I finish this course, I will be looking for employment. When I find employment, my hope is that I can help my family and others as well to be an example for others to follow so they can study like I have studied. We have so many kids in the bush in Mozambique who have amazing potential that God has placed within them. And our desire is that they would be able to grow and develop that potential, that they would come to have a relationship with God and also, yeah, be able to learn and know how much God loves them. And that's my message to them all the time is you can do this. You can 
you can be that person. You know, you can, you can become who you want to be. You can, you can become whoever you want to be. You have to apply yourself, and you have to believe in you. I believe in you, and and you can do it. And you have God's help too. Child sponsorship is a big part of that because it opens doors and provides opportunities for these children to have exactly that hope for a better future um, and the chance to learn to love God and to love people. God wants us to love him with our whole being, with everything he created us with, and, and uh, then reach out. And you know, I think uh, as far as the child sponsorship program, this is something that uh, to me gives almost everyone, especially in the de developed world, an opportunity to touch someone else so practically, because it costs so little, and yet they can make a profound and lasting impact in the life of that child, and that just pays forward over and over and over again in the lives of, of, of future generations, really. If I did not get this help, I would be sitting at home. I would probably just be drinking or wasting my life smoking. I am thankful because the mission has helped me a lot. I pray that God will continue to help the mission as they help me finish my studies. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, our sponsorship program is very similar to like World Vision or Compassion Canada. And I know there's already some people here that sponsor kids either through the sponsorship program or the orphan program. Uh, for our sponsorship program, it's $35 a month. And that provides the child with an opportunity to go to school and we take care of feeding them a meal every day. Like the video said, when they reach the higher grades, they actually have to move out of their communities. And so then we provide them with a place to live and all of the, everything that they need to be able to live and study in a different community. And, you know, it's, it's amazing the impact that you can have just through that um, giving to a child. Um, I have the amazing privilege of being there and actually seeing this in action. And... The, the young man that you saw in the video there, he actually, this last December, graduated from that accounting program at Juanqui Mara, which is one of the um, vocational institutions in Mozambique. And he, as of March this year, was actually employed by us at the mission to help with our accounting and with our finances and in the office. And so it's amazing to see that this young man who started when he was eight years old walking, I was talking to him when I was there in March, and he said he had to walk 15 kilometers one way to come to school. And he started doing that when he was eight years old because he had a desire to do something different with his life. And God has been amazingly faithful. And you see him there today, and now he's serving with us at the mission, being that example for others to follow. And so it makes a difference. We have about 266 children that are in our school in the bush, which is where most of that video was shot from, grade, from preschool to grade five. And then we have an additional 72 children that are studying from grade six all the way up into, we have some that are taking mechanics and agriculture in some of the vocational institutes in Mozambique. And so if you're interested, if you would love to be a part of making a difference in the lives of children in Mozambique, please come and see me after all. We have a table set up outside the door. Um, I'd love to talk to you, meet you, um, and just, yeah, get to know you a little bit. So thank you for this opportunity, and I just pray that God blesses each and every one of you. Thank you. Good job. I, I am very glad that Jeanette could come out today. And I think she, she, because she's trying to respect our time and she doesn't realize she doesn't have to because I always go over time, I need to say some of the things that she didn't say. Um, 
When I got to Mozambique 10 years ago, basically now, it would have been 10 years ago when we got to Mozambique, at that time there was about three to five kids who had passed grade eight. Uh, it was tough because you got to remember when they get to grade six or seven and eight, they're actually living on their own in an apartment uh, with a bunch of other grade six or seven or eight year old kids because there's no one to do the job. And, and in, that, in that time, we had almost nobody beyond grade eight. Um, and I went back now, and, and, and I think when I was back, by, you know, over 10 years, we've tried to change a gen generation, make a value of education. And I think there's over 40 kids or something at this point that, are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that have moved on to those secondary kind of areas, whether it be grade 8, 9, 10, or even to university. I think we have some who are actually in university. We've got one of our orphan kids who's in engineering school. Um, and, and more than anything else, that, man, that's all great. It's all great to get a better life. Uh, but even more than that, I think this last year, I was talking to Dwight when I was just there, and they said they've had over 30 kids this year alone through the school, not because of their churches, not because of their parents, but actually in the school who've given their lives to Jesus Christ in this last year. And when I look at that and I say, when you combine uh, education with, with the love of God and, and a godly lifestyle, how incredible is that story? Um, and one of the things that we don't always realize is that when you bring education, you, 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 you reduce the amount of orphans as well. Because we've got a great orphan program and it's, an, <clears throat> it's awesome. And, and, but the more educated people are, the better their lives are, the better the ed educated they are, the more finances that they can make through those proper employment, the more they give back the less suffering you end up seeing because you begin to take care of some of those areas of struggle. And so uh, we're going to actually go into the message now, uh, and we're going to come back and visit Mozambique in a, couple, in a couple minutes, if you would, maybe at the end of the service. So, But before we do that, let's start with a word of prayer. God, we love you. You are so awesome. I thank you for the difference that you are making in this world through your people. Uh, God, I remember as you... As, as you said through Jesus, that you said when you, you, you went to heaven so that we could do what you have done and even more. And I believe that that's part of what missions is. It's doing that. It's, it's multiplying the work that you did while you were here on earth. And so I just want to pray for everyone doing missions around the world. But I also want to pray for this morning that I not get too distracted uh, and that I stay on target and that, that somebody here hear the words that you have for them in their spirit, God. I just love you and love what you're doing. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, it's very interesting how things worked out for this Sunday. For those of you, those of you who are visiting, we're doing a, a series called the Letters in Red series. And we're walking through and we're looking at all the different things that Jesus said. In many, in many Bibles, the words that Jesus spoke are written in red. And so we're taking a look at the words that Jesus spoke. And it just so happened that this week's message, the, the, the words that, that Jesus spoke that we're going over this week, is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. So I've titled my message this morning, A Heart of Compassion. And I'm going to read that for you right now. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. It's not up there. Um, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that what... <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's scratchy this morning. So that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you give, when you give. It's all about when you give. And so one of the things that I want to talk about is that this is actually not originally, when we look at this, this is not a call to give. Uh, and so it's great. Sometimes people feel like when missionaries come, the pastor always has to do the call to give. The call to give. And don't worry, we'll get there. But... The <laughs> But that's not where we're going to start. Where we're going to start is, is one of the things that we've been looking at, if you are a visitor, is we're trying to find the heart of what the Bible's saying. Sometimes we're very legalistic, and so we read the Bible and we're like, okay, so what, what Jesus is telling us is he's giving us a rule. Close your eyes when you write your check. Or, or you know, put your hand behind so the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Or, or make sure nobody knows how much money you've given. And, and we, we, we like to have a rule there. We like to know what's the rule um, and so if you do a fundraiser, don't announce how much was given because we shouldn't know those things and, and it always has to be done in secret. And, and when we do that, we become very legalistic, even in our giving, even in our generous giving, we become legalistic because we forget that everything that Jesus said was to show us the heart of God and what our heart ought to look like. And so the heart of this passage is not just telling us, uh, what it's 
how we should give, but, but it's talking about what's your heart when you give, because everything Jesus says has to do with your heart. We need to stop, sometimes stop looking at it, what's the rule, and always ask, what's the heart? Jesus wanted to change our heart. But one of the interesting things, and because you knew I was going to get to this yet, one of the interesting things is it doesn't say, if you give. Like I said, sure, it's not a call to give, because Jesus doesn't think there needs to be a call to give. He just assumes that we're all giving. He assumes that everybody here is giving to the needy. So what does he say? He says, when you give. Not helping the hurting is not even an option. So we're going to look at the heart. But before we even look at the heart of why we give and how we give, we need to realize that not giving isn't an option. And not because we had missionaries coming, simply because we got to that passage in what we were already going to speak about. It's one of the beautiful things about going through a series where you read everything that Jesus said. Because then you don't get to skip difficult conversations. And so today we're going to look a little bit deeper at that. But I'm going to keep it, keep it brief because I also want to talk about what God is doing in Africa uh, and, and the joy that I had. So I want to read a couple verses for you. I was going to do Luke 10, 27, which I do often. Uh, and it, it's actually what my, my shirt's life's greatest pursuit to love. And that's Luke, uh, Luke 10, 27 is almost exactly the same as Matthew 22, 36 to 40. So I'm going to read that for you this morning. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So they come to Jesus and they want to know what's the greatest commandment in the law. And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything that is written, everything that Jesus goes on to describe is about one of these two things. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Funa Malungu, Funa Anzako. If you're from the area of Mozambique where I did some of our work, it's, it's the, one of the only words I learned in their language, and it was love God, love people. As a matter of fact, if we keep going, for example, we read in James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Love people, and then keep yourself from being polluted. Love God. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Not giving, not helping the needy is never even an option. And if you think it is, read your Bible. So I'm not going to do a whole message on it this morning, because if you think it's okay to not help the hurting, just read your Bible. And then come back to me and show me where it says that. But we know that everywhere in the Bible it always says, it is our, one of the things that we must do is to help the needy. But here's the problem. We, I, I believe that as, as, as a generation, as a people, we've lost sight of the heart of this passage. We've lost sight of the heart of, of giving to the needy. We've lost sight of the heart of why we give at church. It's always about an obligation. Somebody comes and we have a wonderful person come and give a presentation about missions and deep in our spirit we say, oh well, I better, if I'm not sponsoring at least one child, I'm probably not making God happy. And, and sometimes what happens is when we give the wrong way, when we serve the wrong way, when we, we make a difference the wrong way, we're still making a difference. We're still serving. We're still helping. But we're missing out on what God has for us because we're doing it with the wrong heart. It's one of the reasons you'll probably never hear me preach on giving 10%. Now, don't get me wrong. 10%, and we're, this is not part of my notes. You can see I'm not even using my notes. 10% is not... 10% is not a bad thing to do. It's an incredibly good, wise principle. But we also have to remember that that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, give till you, give till you can't give. And so you'll never, because Jesus is talking about the heart. Jesus is saying, where is your heart at when you support missions? Where is your heart at with the time that you volunteer? Are you doing it out of duty or are you doing it out of compassion? Because the root of helping the hurting is love and compassion. And my question for you this morning is, do you need a refill of compassion? Because everywhere I go, everywhere I look, I see a people who are slowly letting, letting our compassion die. When you go to the coffee shop and you hear what people are talking about, you see people and you hear people who have lost their compassion. We've gotten so legalistic in our giving we've gotten so detail oriented in some things that we've lost sight of what God really wants for us see we got to realize something Jesus did not help because he was bound by the law 
Jesus did not help because he had to help because of the law. He was not bound by the law. He was not obligated by the law. He was obligated by compassion. Jesus was forced to make a difference, but he was forced because of his heart. His heart said there's nothing else you can do but to make a difference. And I'm sorry, apparently I did my PowerPoint and I didn't forward it. I think that's what happened this morning. So there, there was a PowerPoint and it was awesome. The best PowerPoint I've ever done. Um, I can say that because you don't get to see it. Um, and so, but, but, but one of the things that we need to realize is that Jesus, Jesus was forced to give, but he was forced by his heart. And I, maybe you don't know what I mean. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Feeding your child. You might not be forced to feed your child. Well, I guess the law would force you to feed your child, but, but you could probably get away with it not feeding your child for a while. But your heart demands that you feed your baby. Your heart demands, your heart has a demand, your heart forces you to do something. And what's happened in our world is we no longer allow our hearts to force us to do anything. We allow our religion to force us to do something. We allow the obligation to force us to do something. And so you know what ends up happening? We give a fraction of what our heart says we ought to give because we no longer allow ourselves to be controlled by our hearts. And the moment we throw our hearts out, the moment we throw that emotion out, we lose what God has to offer. How often do we not even want any emotion in the church? How often do you talk to people who get frustrated if the preacher pulls into emotion? If we have, you know, or we get frustrated if we, if I were to put a picture of a little kid who's like desperately hungry and preaching this message right now, some of you would want to walk out. How dare you play on my heart? You realize that God gave it to you. You realize he did it for a reason. Because God wants you to use your mind and he wants you to use your heart. And the moment we stop listening to that heart, that heart of compassion is the moment we lose out on the heart of God. I'm going to read some more. I know we've already had three or four verses, but we're going to do a ton of them this morning. Matthew. I, I looked just in the book of Matthew. There's a whole bunch of stuff, but I didn't want to repeat, uh, just use the same verse in Luke that's also in Matthew. So I just looked at Matthew. And there are at least four times in Matthew where we see Jesus being forced to do something by his heart. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And I'm not going to keep reading. That's Matthew 9, verse 36. Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, this is a different time now, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. You see that compassion in the Bible, it's almost like being forced by your heart. You're, he saw them and his heart forced him to heal them. <laughs> you know, his heart, his heart was so pulled, was so drawn that he could do nothing but heal them. He was on a mission, he was on a duty, but he had to stop what he was doing because his heart compelled him. When was the last time in your life that you were compelled by your heart? Oh yeah, we're compelled by our religion all the time. We're compelled by some preacher yelling at us that we need to give all our money to the church. That might compel us, but you know what? We will never give with a joyful heart. Matthew 15, 32. Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. So he's in the middle. He's like, I'm going to teach them about my father. I'm going to teach them about my father. And then he's like, stop. So I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm going to stop evangelizing for a minute. My heart is telling me to stop evangelizing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should stop evangelizing. But I'm saying he was forced by his heart to meet a need. He had to meet the need. His heart said, stop. Not, his, not the law, not his religion, nothing but his heart said, I need to have compassion. And yet so often in my life, I lack that compassion. Matthew 20, verse 34. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. There were some people who were blind. They could not see. Jesus had other things to do. But Jesus had compassion. He was compelled by his heart to make a difference. How often are you led by your heart? And so that leads me to the question, do you care? Are you a person who actually cares at all anymore? Or when you go and evangelize, maybe, maybe you're, maybe you're not, I, I meet people like, like this all the time. They are determined to save the world. They want to evangelize everybody. Not because they care. Because they're a Christian. They don't care about the person's story. And, and so they go out and they begin to evangelize. And you know what happens? Very few people come to know Jesus through them. 
Oh, don't get me wrong, I can be the most charismatic speaker on the face of the planet, but if I talk to somebody, half the people I meet are going to be offended. Because here's how it goes. How are you doing? Have you heard about Jesus? You're like, whoa, 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 why don't we first stop with how are you doing? Do you actually care? Or are you just on a mission to make a checklist for God? You see, that's not how Jesus worked. Jesus wasn't making a checklist for his Father. That wasn't even... When you read about, the, about Jesus' ministry, it seemed like that was never his concern. His concern was always, I want to know their heart. They bring an adulterous woman before him who, who by law, he, he, they're allowed to stone this woman. By law, they are allowed to kill her. So his religion ought to compel him to do this. But his heart, being led by the Holy Spirit, said, I cannot do that. He says, there's a deeper message here, and the message is, what is her story? Go and sin no more. He was, he was compelled by his heart, and his heart was controlled by the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not just enough to be compelled by your heart. It's, it's important that to remember before we go any further, if, if we were all just to run by our hearts, but none of us followed God, none of us read the Word, none of us knew the Holy Spirit, our hearts might lead us in bad places. But when we are led by the Holy Spirit and we are, allow our heart to be... Because that's, that's where the Holy Spirit seems to primarily work, isn't it? The Holy Spirit tends to pull on your heart. More than anything, the Bible pulls on your mind. We need to read the Bible because we need to have our, our minds and our hearts in unison here. So we read our Bible, we get our mind right, but we have to be sensitive to our hearts. Because if we weren't, why did God give it to us? God wanted us. God was pulled by His heart all the time. Everywhere he, everywhere he went, almost every part of His ministry had to do with Him being pulled by His heart because that was where the Holy Spirit was working in Him. So do you care? When the people... Around when you see people in pain, does it does it does it hurt your heart? Here's a good way, good way to know if you've got compassion. Okay, so well we've all got compassion for our children. Do you ever see other people like they're your family? When you see that homeless guy on the street, do you ask yourself, what would I do if my child was homeless? That's a good that's a good test. If that was my child, what would I do? Yeah, but that person deserves it. Okay. So if it was your child. Who deserved it? Well, oh, no, my child does my, my baby would never deserve that. Well, what if your baby did exactly what this person did? But they're my baby. They never deserve that. My little girl, my little boy never would deserve to live on the street. No matter how bad a mistake they would, I would never allow that to happen. My heart would compel me to do something to protect them. Really? So why do we just throw everybody out like garbage? Why do we do that? Why do we allow ourselves to do that? If you do that, then you truly don't have the compassion that God has called you to have. When Jesus says, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing, what he's saying is, do you care? Are you doing it out of obligation or are you doing it out of passion? Because if you do it out of obligation, you get all the reward right there. That's all you get. But when we do things because the Holy Spirit compels us, it says then you reap the reward. It's funny, the Bible works together. What's the reward of walking according to the Holy Spirit? being led by the heart that the Holy Spirit has given us. When you are led by the Holy Spirit, you will produce the fruit. You knew that was coming up, didn't you? The Bible says it. I have to say it because every single thing I always preach about is being led by the Holy Spirit. And if we're led by the Holy Spirit, there's a reward. Love. I'll tell you what, when you give because you care, love will grow. When Ed comes to the front and he says, hey, you guys should help love lives here. And you say, I like Ed. I guess Ed's got a good point. The Bible says, help the needy. Here's my check. That's all the reward you get. You never experience an overwhelming sense of love, do you? Oh, you might feel a little bit of, I feel good about myself, but you don't feel that overwhelming sense of love. But you know what happens? When you go to Love Lives here, as an example, and you ask somebody, what's your story? And they tell you the brokenness that they're going through. Do you know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit fills you with a love that you've never known in your life. When you begin to actually care, and when you at least begin to hear people's story. So here's my challenge for you. How do you grow in compassion? How do we do this? How do we be the people that Jesus wants us to be? Because many of us, many of us don't know how to have compassion. Many of, us, many of us go about our day and we say, I get it. I should have a heart that cares, but I just don't give a rip. Like when I see somebody, all I get is frustrated. Well, the first thing that you need to do is you need to recognize the bondage in your life. Some of us have bondage in our life. For some of us, some of us, our bondage to compassion is racism. I'm just going to put it out there. 
I'm going to be real this morning. Some of us, we are bound by racism. And it keeps us from being compassionate. When you go and you see people in downtown, what do you think? Is the first thing that pops to your mind something about their race? I bet you it is. I can almost guarantee that at least 50% of us go, yeah, I know. And I'm actually going to be even more real. I'm going I'm to I'm point out some of these things as we go along here. We've actually only got a couple. This is my second last slide. You guys wouldn't know that. Um, but it's my second last slide. I'm going to start off. How do you grow in, grow in compassion? Some, number one, start asking people their story. Hey, what are you going through? Even if you want to go do evangelism, don't start with evangelism. Start by saying, hey, how's it going? So tell me about your, do you have any kids? Oh, yeah, my wife, she left me. Well, so, so what happened there? Well, you know, I had an addiction. Really? So what was your addiction? You start, you start actually caring. Like, actually listen to what they're telling you. Start listening to people, actually caring. I know that sometimes some, I, I, I've been told before that I like to, I, 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 I listen so that I can respond. You know who you are. Somebody told me I listen. <laughs> I listen so I can respond. I'm just putting people on the spot. I get to do that from the front. And you're right, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I already have a goal in mind. And so I already have a, I'm already on a path. I'm like, so tell me your story. I'm ready. Okay, here, bam, I got you. There, I'm looking for the loophole. What if you just cared? What if we just started caring? So tell me your story. And don't try to do it one time. Get through a whole conversation. Let somebody run out of things to say before you respond. Let them run out of things to say. So uh, and that might take a while if you're talking to me. Um, I was assuming that's what Pam was thinking. So, so um, what you do is you listen. You say, what, what, what's going on in your life? Do you know what? Everybody has a story. Everybody I've ever met has a story. You know what? If you talk to a prostitute, she's got a story. She's not just some woman who's... <laughs> Thanks, Heather. She's not just some woman... With a derogatory term, you know, we call them you know, some derogatory term. She's not just some slut. She's not just some blankety, blankety, blank, or whatever is that derogatory term you're going to use. She's there for a reason. I want to tell you something, and this is going to come to the racism part that we're going we're to deal with right away. Is, you know what? We, we, we look downtown in Winnipeg, and we see the, the women in prostitution, and, and we hear about people saying, look at all the First Nations women, women who are being murdered, in pro, murdered, and we say, well, that's because they're all prostitutes. You're just like, Rick, how dare you say it? That's not what I'm saying. It's what I hear you saying. It's what I hear you saying in the coffee shop. It's what I hear you saying with your friends. It's because they're in prostitution. Of course, that's why they're getting murdered. But have you ever asked somebody their story? You ever think that maybe that, 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 that woman, when she was a little girl, living on the reserve, got raped, got sexually assaulted, was told that her only value was in her body? And she runs away because she's being beaten and abused and, and, and sexually assaulted. And, and the only way to get rid of that pain is what? Drown it in drugs and alcohol. But you know what happens when you drown it in drugs and alcohol? Somebody says, you now owe me 500 bucks because I've given you drugs and alcohol. You know how you're going to pay me back? There's a street corner. And people are bound by the things that somebody has done to them, and instead of seeing them for who they are, we say that's just somebody from the reserve. That's just somebody who's just gotten everything for free, and so now they're a prostitute, or a drug addict, or an alcoholic. But have you ever sat down and actually asked one of those people their story? Sometimes the story you get is horrible. Sometimes just hearing their story almost wants to drive you to drinking, and you didn't have to live it. And I look at our world and I go, you know, what if we just started caring? What if we just started hearing people's stories? You know, we hear everybody hating on refugees. They're all a bunch of Muslim terrorists. Let's just say, I'm just going to say everything the way I'm feeling this morning. They're just a bunch of Muslim terrorists. Really? Have you visited with a single one? Have you sat down and asked, asked a single one? Did you know, for example... For example, that the little girl in Kleefeld has to go for hearing aids. Yes, of course, now our government's got to pay out the hearing aids. Been, our government ought to put their money somewhere else, and how dare they? You know what? A bomb blew up and blew her eardrums out. What would you do if that happened to your baby? Let's go back to the point of compassion. If it was your baby, what would, you, what would it be worth? What, what should our government do if it was your baby? Have you ever asked somebody their story? 
The reason that we don't care is because we stopped asking people, tell me about yourself. And yeah, you might meet a, you might meet a refugee who's a terrorist. It could happen. You could do something at that point because you've asked them their story and they've let you know. At that point, we can solve the problem. But right now, we can't solve the problem. Why? Because none of us want to ask the questions. None of us care. We, we, we just, we, I'm not putting, I, I'm, I'm not part of the none of us. Don't worry, I'm not, I know some of us do care. But I look at our world and I go, do you know what? Our world would be a lot different if we stopped just giving because we had to and, then, and analyzing everything. Okay, well, this person deserved it. What if we just started asking, hey, what's your story? Where are you at? See, so number two, <laughs> see each person as an individual and not a group. Stop putting people in boxes from their race, from their religion, from, any, from their sexual orientation. Serious, I'm going to put that out there. I know the Bible has truth about what is and is not sin, but that doesn't mean that we get to treat people badly because they're doing something that we disagree with, that we know to be sin. We don't have that right. We ought to be moved by compassion. We ought to be moved by compassion by what people are going through. We ought to care in our lives. And yes, sin is still always sin. I am in no way justifying sin by what I'm telling you right now. But what I am saying is stop putting people in people groups. Stop put, start seeing Bob as Bob and Susie as Susie and say, what's your story? Do you know what? I was at the, I was at the uh, uh, hospital the other day and the uh, police, police officer was there and he was talking about how he said they had a grand slam. That's what it was. There was a grand, called it the grand slam because all the washrooms in the one area, there were four washrooms and they were all... They had to break into every washroom because in every washroom there was somebody who drank the hand sanitizer to get pass out drunk. And I could hear it. I, as he was speaking, I could hear the different people muttering. Like I was in the, I could hear people muttering, oh, I bet you they were this kind of people, or I bet you they were this type of people. And the only thing I could think of, oh my word, where do you have to be at in life that your kids don't matter? Like, what pain are you drowning when your kids don't matter, food doesn't matter, not even life matters, just to get something that you've got to, you've got to put your head underneath a hand sanitizer and, and, and wave at it until it empties all the hand sanitizer in your mouth? What is the horrible thing that you are trying to drown out? And, and I, I realize that as long as we put people in people groups, we will never see their, their brokenheartedness. My wife, my wife and myself, we struggled this, this when we were in Africa. Um, Heather had a miscarriage, and I think all you guys knew that. You had, we, Heather had a miscarriage, um, and she was in a, in a, in a very tough, st- tough point. And uh, me being a foolish person, I'd stayed at the, at, the, at the mission to have a meeting one time, and she'd gone for an ultrasound, I think it was, right after she had that miscarriage. And, and the doctor said, you may have to go down to South Africa to, get, to, ha- to have everything removed. And... Uh, she was broken, and she still had stuff to get done. And she was all by herself, and she goes into the store, um, and, and she calls me up, and she's trying to tell me what's going to happen, and, and she just breaks down broken. And this lady comes up to her, a friend of hers, comes up behind her, puts her arm all around her, and says, hey, can I pray for you? And she said, I just want to pray for you in your difficult time. And she prays and she prays and she prays. And, and, and it comforts Heather in her difficult time. And, and it was amazing how the Holy Spirit moved in Heather's heart in that moment. You know how we knew this lady. This lady was, uh, was a devout Muslim. And uh, she gave us, because we cared for orphans, which is one of the pillars of Islam, she would, she would, give, us, she would give us discounts on all the stuff we bought for orphans. And in that moment, she was moved by compassion. And she did not pray to Allah. She prayed to God. And how often do we put a people group? Heather could have said, well, I'm not letting you pray for me. Back off. But here, when we see people as individuals and not as a people group, she could have said, back off, you crazy terrorist. No, isn't that how we do things here? Isn't that, isn't that how we live in our world? Just back off. And she said, no. And in her brokenness, look, God used this woman from a completely different religion, a religion that does not know the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet God used that because Heather, every time Heather would come into that store, when, her, when that lady's husband was, 
Had, he got malaria all the time. He always had malaria. She would pray for him. And that woman, she also couldn't have children. And every time she would go, she would, can I pray that? Can I pray for you? And just like we adopted that lady, eventually she now has a little, the cutest little boy of her own. And when she got that little boy, actually because of the unfaithfulness of her husband, to be honest, and and then she got, huh? Oh, it's a little girl. Sorry, I I just the faithfulness of faith, unfaithfulness of the husband. She she she's able to adopt this 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 baby. And when she does, what does she do? She comes to heaven and she says, thank you. Thank you for praying for me. You see, everybody you meet has a story. There is nobody, who, there is nobody going through anything who doesn't have a story. Number three, what if they were in my family? You want to grow your compassion, ask yourself that question. What if they were in my family? What if, what if something happened to them? What if that was my little girl? We all know... Let's be real. We all know that anybody can get addicted to alcohol and drugs. Anybody in the wrong group with the wrong situation can get burdened down by something that they wouldn't. What would you give to get your child out of pain? Even pain they got into themselves. And begin to live your life like that. When you make, when you make a donation, when you make a difference, when you go to feed the hungry, when you are asked to help in some area, ask yourself, what would I do if this was my child? You say, well, if it was my child, I would sit them down and I would tell them to fix their mistakes. Okay, perfect. Do you know what? We need volunteers. <laughs> there's a lot of people who need, there's prison ministry that's needed. And if you think, if you think you could do it with your own child and you would teach them and you would tell them how to shape up, great. We can use you. The world can use you. Jesus can use you. If you think that's what you would do, volunteer. There's a ton of places that need great, strong mother and fatherly figures for counseling. Well, then I would help them. Okay, then start helping. Start making a difference. Not because I told you to. Don't listen to me. Listen to the Holy Spirit in your heart. That's the whole point of the message. <laughs> Don't listen to me. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you in your heart. Put yourself in their shoes. Do a missions trip, but not just to work. Don't like I know everybody, we always do a mission. I just want to be doing construction. Do the construction, but make sure in your construction trip you take time to sit down with the person whose house you're building. Say, hey, tell me about yourself. Tell me your story. Do you know what? You're going to have ten times more joy. You're going to experience, here's, how, here's the kicker, you're going to experience the joy of the Holy Spirit from Galatians 5.22. You're going to experience that when you live according to the Spirit, which says love your neighbor as yourself. And you ask them their, their story, and you actually care to hear it. Do a mission trip. Volunteer in outreach. Go somewhere and ask people their story. Go visit a different culture. Maybe you've got a problem with our First Nations people of Canada. I just, just this week, just this week, Fisher Bay Bible Camp that I used to direct is asking for help. Do you know what? You're going to get over your racism pretty doggone quickly when you meet these incredible people doing incredible things. Many of them are bound by, by, by things that have happened to them in their past, and your heart is going to break, and you're going to want them to be set free. And no longer are you going to see the world that way. And I want to put one more example because it's an example that some of us know. The other day I stopped by the, I needed, some, I needed something, some medicine, and I stopped by the pharmacy here in town. And uh, in my time here in the year, I know there's many people who, don't, who, who haven't gone to that pharmacy. I know nobody likes it when we're specific about our illustrations. But many people haven't gone to that pharmacy because that lady's from somewhere else. Uh, and what if, she's, uh, what if she's a Muslim? What if she's whatever? Did you know that lady? We sat down. I had a great talk with her. She had a sign up because she was kind of, not, I don't want to say mourning, but she was, she was remembering the martyrs that have died in Egypt. You see, she's actually Christian. She's a Coptic Christian, and, 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 and in Egypt, people are being killed all the time for their faith. And did you know that that lady at that pharmacy, she gives money. She does whatever she can to end the suffering of Christians being killed, people that, that she would be connected with who are being killed for their faith. Many of us probably didn't know that because we probably never had a conversation <laughs> And, he, and maybe you're one of those people who, who thought she wasn't a Christian. You thought maybe she was a Muslim or thought maybe she was a Hindu or thought maybe she was somebody else. Here's the point of the whole story. You would have known if you would have talked to her. And had you talked to her, you would have been moved with compassion for the martyrs of Egypt. Isn't it amazing how God works when we let down our own judgments 
and we say, I want to be moved with compassion. I'm not going to give out obligation. I'm not going to serve out of obligation. I'm done doing that. I'm done doing things because of my religion, and I'm not going to start doing things because I care. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give me a heart that cares, and I want to be led by that Holy Spirit. So finally, we're going to invite the worship team up. I'm going to do a short presentation of missions when we're done, but I want people to be able to respond to the call that, I've gone, that I'm saying right now. Maybe you're one of those people who always judges. Maybe it's time that you come to God and say, God, I'm sorry. When I see the prostitute, I see the woman who deserves it. How about this? When I see the, when I see the pimp, I see just the devil. Do you know what? He's there for a reason as well. Something happened to him as well. The drug dealer, something happened to him as well. If that's who you are, maybe it's time that you come to God and say, God, I need your heart. I need to feel what you feel. I need to see what you see. So I want to challenge you this morning. i got a couple prayers for you. In 1 Corinthians, it tells us, talking about the spiritual gifts, it tells us to seek the greater gifts. And when I was 16 years old, I was at camp, and I was being told that if I didn't speak in tongues, I wasn't a Christian. And I was, I was devastated, and I began to read my Bible. And my Bible kept telling me, seek the gifts. Seek, seek the help of the Holy Spirit. Seek the supernatural that's going to make a difference. And so I sat down that day as a 16-year-old, and I prayed for like half an hour. And I said, this was my only prayer. I said, God, if you could give me one thing, let me see the heart of your children. And I, and I could tell you story after story after story where people did horrible things, and instead of seeing those horrible things, I saw the brokenness. I had a young man punch me in the face. I was a youth, youth leader, and he, he made a weird sexual advance at me one day. I didn't know why, and I moved his hand and said, excuse me, that's not appropriate. And he turned around and just started decking me in the face. We were in, we were in a vehicle, and he was just decking me in the face. And I'm like, dude. And so I pinned the guy down, big boy, and I held him down. And, and, and two days later, everything in me wanted to kick him out of youth. Everything in me wanted to just give him a couple black eyes, like, dude, what are you doing? Two days later, I went to his house. The Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit showed me something. Not the action. The Holy Spirit said, this boy is going to kill himself. That's not me. I, have no, I deserve no credit in this story. But I went over to that kid's house and I said, hey, buddy. Showed up. He, he got off the bus. He was in grade 11 or 12. He got off the bus. And I said, sit in my car. He sat in my car. I said, I think, I think you're going to kill yourself. And the kid broke down weeping. He broke down weeping because he had a noose in his attic. And every day he'd come home from school. When I, he was coming home from school to tie and retie that noose. He had it stacked up on some square bales, and his, his plan was to just tip the bale over when he had it on his neck. You see, I had two choices. I could have responded the way I wanted to respond, and I could have justifiably done that. Somebody's punching in your face, I could have justifiably defended myself and cleaned some cloth, but I didn't. And so my challenge for you this morning is maybe it's time that we start to pray that God show us the heart of people. Because as I will never, I regret a lot of stupid things I've done in life. I, and I keep doing stupid things. But what I don't regret is that prayer. Show me the heart of people. And everybody I meet from that day forward, I ask myself, what is their heart? What could have got them so messed up that they'd be such a jerk? <laughs> What, what could have got them so messed up? And so if you've got somebody that you need to forgive in your life, come this morning and say, God, let me see their hearts. And then seek out their heart. If you feel like you haven't had compassion, maybe you realize that you didn't think you were a racist until your pastor started yelling and screaming at you. Okay, maybe you need to give that to God. Maybe that's, maybe that's bondage in your life that's keeping you from fully experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to get, if you want to get rid of that stuff in your life, come, and, come to the front and pray. But if you're new to this church and you don't know what we, what we do here, if you're sick, we pray for the sick. If you need to forgive somebody, we pray for you. If, you. if you've been burdened by abuse in your life, you've got pain in your life that you need to get, get rid of, come to the front. And finally, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God says that when you come to him, he will give you love, joy, and peace that is supernatural, that nobody can have if they are not a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's not even focus on heaven right now. If you just need a supernatural touch of love and joy and peace in your life, come and pray with us this morning and learn what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit. So we're so incredibly excited for what God's going to do. And let's just pray that God grow our compassion so we be like Jesus. I'm just going to pray, and then the band is going to take over. God, sometimes I'm a judgmental jerk. 
And I need to be set free from that, God. God, sometimes I allow my pain to keep me from forgiving, and I need to be set free from that. God, sometimes I'm a blazing racist, and I need to be set free from that. And God, I know I am not alone, so this morning, I pray that if you need to move in somebody's heart, if you need to move people to compassion, that you would do that this morning. I thank you that you forgave me when I didn't deserve it. And help us to have that same heart for everybody we meet. Thank you. Amen. Speak to me now. I 